All right, this is an interview with John Newman, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 24th of November, 2003, approximately 2.30 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, sir. It's John T. Newman, N-E-W-M-A-N. I was born on the 26th of uh, August. No, I'm sorry, uh, 8th of August in 1926. Okay. In Hornell, New York. All right. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Oh, I was a kid. I enlisted when I was 17. Okay. Did you finish high school yet? Or yes, sir. You, I graduated from high school. Okay. <coughs> and it was interesting because uh, <laughs> my aunt worked in the producer's gas company in Old, Old, Old Ann, New York, mm -hmm. and it was right across the road, the way from the in, naval uh, uh, guy that put people in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she went and talked to them, and they had, a, believe it or not, they had a, a, a quota in those days. And uh, so she moved me into the top 50 so I could get into the Navy, because that's where I wanted to go. <laughs> now your parents signed for you? No, they didn't have to sign, because they, I, they, talk, they called me when I was 18. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went when I was 18. Uh, yes, sir. Um, how come uh, being landlocked out there, uh, how did you pick the Navy? Oh, I always loved ships and the sea and... Everything like that. Had you ever been on a ship before? <clears throat> Not been on a ship, but uh, my dad was an engineer, a civil engineer on the railroad, so mm -hmm. we had uh, passes on the railroads and we went to uh, Staten Island every year. So I learned to uh, uh, swim in the ocean and see the, you know, see the water and mm -hmm. be a part of it. So I was always pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, it, obviously, it was uh, Sunday afternoon, and um, I'd gone to church that day with my parents, always did. And uh, it, it actually, you know, <laughs> it's pretty shocking to all of us. And uh, I, I was uh, one of the youngest air raid wardens in my town, because <laughs> like, I was only 13 or 14, so... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I was conscious of it mm -hmm. well before that. Um, when when did you uh, when did you become an air raid warden? Well, <clears throat> when I was like 13 or 14, 15, somewhere along How that did line. You, did someone ask you yeah. or did you volunteer to do this? Yeah, and, and then my mother ran the air warning volunteer service. So when somebody couldn't pitch in, you know who went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you tell us about being a warden? That's kind of interesting. What, well, it was fascinating. You well, you, you did like, you're just like if we're in Eng England, except you wasn't any th threat. And, uh -huh. and I got people to close their shades and everything. I mean, it was kind of weird. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you walked around the streets at Absolutely. night? Absolutely. Yeah, well, we, had, uh, we had drills and everything else. Well, did you wear any kind of uniform or any kind of badge or armband or anything? I think so, but I really, you know, I'm, I'm just think. Okay. I think I did have an armband, but I, uh, and uh, I think I even had a helmet, which is, it's so totally ridiculous, and Angelica was just so far from anything, but I mean, we, that's, I think that's the atmosphere we were in, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and like, <coughs> the warning, air warning volunteer service, jeez, you know, we Did you ever go out at night, like, as a spotter or anything like that, or? Oh well, sure. That we we uh, uh, operated from the fairgrounds. Uh, I don't know how often now. I can't quite remember. Uh -huh. But uh, mother had a whole crew of people went up there religiously, and we that's what we were doing spotting. Absolutely. So did you have identification books and everything? Oh, or? definitely. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. <laughs> now, how long did you do this? Well, I I probably you know I'm. I'm kind of hesitant on dates or anything because uh, I obviously graduated from high school in 1944 mm -hmm. and uh, then I already enlisted in the Navy so I was called in August and uh, I, I don't remember when all this that sequence mm -hmm. of that kind of thing okay. took place. Okay. All right, um, when you went in the Navy, uh, where did you go for your basic training? Uh, went to Samson. <laughs> okay, and... Uh, D unit up there as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, what did you... Uh, it was in the winter. <laughs> oh, in the winter. What kind of basic training, what kind of things did you do there? <clears throat> All you can remember uh, was getting up four or five in the morning and going out in ice-cold weather 
and doing calisthenics. And if you remember back in those days, 17-year-old kids, 18-year-old kids were pretty naive. And because I came from a family where, you know, the law was the law and this was an important part of your life, I volunteered for stuff. <laughs> And I made semen first out of just out of boot camp, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, were, were you given any kind of specialized training at all? Uh, not in boot camp. Um, I, I got otitis media in my ears, and I missed my first assignment. And I was told that the unit that I was assigned to, unfortunately, had a bad uh, accident or collision or something. So uh, when I finally got sent to Fort Pierce, Florida, for amphib training, uh -huh. so I was a coxswain on a landing craft. I went through that whole basic training, and shortly, I might maybe I forget how many weeks it was now, and people don't realize, you know, they hear about this about people dying here. We were losing men in training. Uh -huh. I mean, you'd have you'd have a ramp break on an LCVP in those days. That's a pretty serious situation. <clears throat> so I got a appendicitis attack, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, it isn't that serious. Uh, you don't have to have it out. And I said, I could picture myself being at sea with the pharmacist made listening in the radio. Cut where? <laughs> I said, no, thank you. I'm going to have it out right now. <laughs> so so <laughs> that's what I did. And... Uh, the, the, believe it or not, the <clears throat> doctor that cut my appendix was so far ahead of his time, it was unbelievable. In those days, you know, you had an incision like uh -huh. several inches, uh -huh. right? This guy's incision was about three inches. Huh. And and uh, not only that, but I watched him take my appendix out. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and this doctor, he was so good. Like... In those days, you were in bed several days, right? Uh -huh. He had me up in 12, 14 hours scrubbing the walls of the infirmary. Uh -huh. And five days later, I was on my way home from sick leave. <clears throat> so that's what happened. So when I got back from leave, my unit had gone. So I got reassigned and uh, had still was going to be an LCV landing craft. And I uh, was on this LST heading overseas. Uh, and, geez, we hit a hurricane off the coast of Cuba. I got bounced around pretty bad and got a pretty serious leg injury and put in the hospital in Panama. And uh, so when I got out of the hospital, it, <clears throat> you know how things probably saved my life. Uh, I was assigned to the YNG-9, guarding the entrance to the canal. And so your, your landing craft days were over. <laughs> I mean, you know, it became radar sonar, and we worked at, at four on and eight off, or eight on, four off, I've forgotten which. And it was a great boat because uh, it was Dungaree Navy. We had a 24-hour galley, and when you weren't, when you weren't uh, on duty, you could fish. Well, we caught some fantastic fish. 11 foot tiger shark, 9 foot hammerhead, and I got this one big sea bass. And uh, the, it happened, it, this is like a Diamond Damon Runyon story because we got this uh, uh, boat that came out almost, you know, almost daily, and we put the ship fish, it was about 400 pounds, we put it on the ship boat and we took it in to sell it in town, and we, <laughs> we got in, and of course, the tropical sun started beating down on us. Says we better sell it pretty quick, or we're going to have to pay somebody to take it off our hands. So we got two hotels to cut it in half, and we got twenty bucks from each hotel. <laughs> but I, I love Panama. I thought it was just a great country, mm -hmm. and uh, I really enjoyed uh, working there. And then once the once the war was over, that ship was decommissioned. I was uh, stationed right there in Cocosolo. Uh, in the uh, refrigeration depot, putting food on ships go going out and coming in. And uh, I did have one ex interesting experience. I got a call from the officer today, and he told me to go to the airport and pick this guy up. And he didn't tell me who it was or anything. And I got there, and this 
guy with a wrinkled green suit got off the plane and never said a word, just got in the car, and I drove him down to the uh, pier, and he got on the Prince Eugen, which was a German pocket battleship. One of the most beautiful ships I've ever seen in my life. It was gorgeous. And <clears throat> I found, about a month later, I was reading the Saturday Post. This was one of the scientists that went out to the adults on the testing. Hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah. But he never said a word. He didn't hmm. say who he was. Well, you know, and, uh -huh. uh, and I wasn't an officer. I was just a SK-2C at the time. But uh, that was... Now the, the German battleship was, yeah. had been captured then, or surrendered, right? Oh, oh it was after the at war. At the time, so, yeah. yeah. They yeah. took it out to the... Uh, uh -huh. Now, did they fly the an American flag, or what kind of flag did it fly? Yeah, that's a hell of a good question. I, I'm sorry. It's, okay. it's a heck of a question, because I really don't remember. All I remember is being enthralled by this picture, this most beautiful ship I've ever seen. Huh. And uh, it had to be our... Well, I don't know whether it was our flag or not. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's an interesting yeah, question, yeah. <laughs> but we were using it, it and um, General Vernon, last year I had lunch with General Vernon Walters, which is, who was the most interesting guy you'd ever want to meet. General Walters was advisor to six presidents. He was in four wars, starting with the China, Greece, uh, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He knew 33 languages, and he didn't have a college education. Yeah. Fascinating guy. So when he told me, we were at this uh, sort of luncheon, and I said, General Waters, I know you went to the Atolls. I said, that was where the Prince a Eugen was, was sent out to be someplace. He said, you know, they couldn't sink it. I said, no, he said, they, it got so radio radioactive they had to sink, scuttle it. Oh, <laughs> it was fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> and the one thing, you know, I was going to say when I was manning the refrigeration depot, there's sometimes, and I probably that's one of why I never stayed in, uh, I, I was in the inactive reserve till 1955, but I never was active reserve after 47, I think. And... Uh, the fascinating thing happened. I caught three Marines in the ice box. So I said to them, I said, have you taken anything out? And oh no, they hadn't taken anything out. And uh, they were going to say, well, we're going home next week. Please don't turn us in, that kind of thing. But you've got to cover yourself on those uh -huh. things. So I let them get out of there. And I went out and fired a shot off so I'd have to report it uh, about 15 minutes after they left. Well, sure enough, the next morning we found stuff that was outside the refrigeration depot, so I would have been a deep doodle. Uh. <laughs> and, and then also, uh, I de started deactivating some of these bases. I had two sandblast Indians that worked with me, and uh, fascinating. Yeah, they're, but the tallest one I ever saw was about 4'11. Huh. And what they would come from the sandblast islands, and they'd work six months with you. And one of them would go home and the other one would come back. So they had two brothers. And they spoke mostly Spanish. And I, my Spanish was much better than it is today. <laughs> but uh, I just enjoyed their company. So my hard working young, young oh, men. They helped close up the bases? Is that what they well, did? Well, we're, we're, we're deactivating, deactivating certain parts of it. You oh, know what okay. I mean? Because um, I remember we had 11 cases of spam. <laughs> And when people were enjoying spam in those days, but uh, they, they were really fascinating. One day we, we were working and they brought in a big iguana for, for lunch. So they cooked it up and I ate it. <laughs> but I love Panama. I love the people. And uh, you might be interested in this, that, uh, <coughs> you know, in, that, in those days, the uh, Panamanians didn't have an army. Mm -hmm. They just had a police force. Well, a guy by the name of Arnulfo Arias tried to take the country over. And a whole bunch of his people started shooting the policemen in the corners, and, and uh, they had several of them that got arrested and taken to the police station inside. They started shooting the place up. So we went on full alert. And my, my battle station, for want of a better term, is, want a better term, is guarding the gasoline dump. <laughs> 
fortunately nothing came of it and we did take the country back in a couple of days but uh, you, you didn't know what was going on and it, I think the thing you got to stress is we know knew so little about what was going on I mean you wouldn't know what was going on in the next room hardly, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was just a tremendous ignorance compared to today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But I loved the Navy and uh, I, I, my dad died while I was overseas and they flew me home for that. And uh, two engine plane across the Caribbean and if you don't find Getmo, Guantanamo Bay, you're going to be in the drink. So, <clears throat> and then we hit a, a Tremendous storm off Miami, and uh, thunder and lightning. And you know, you've always heard, well, lightning doesn't hit the planes. Well, now you've heard they do it to <laughs> the planes. <laughs> so on the way back, uh, we developed an oil leak in a plane, and we landed in, in um, the famous Navy base uh, in Maryland, uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. I think that's what it was, and. They ushered us right off the planes and right inside these buildings with no windows, right? Because it's a secret base, you know, they did all kinds of stuff there. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to go to the bathroom, and I got in the bathroom, and it was so hot, I opened the window just as a jet was taken off. Nobody even heard of jets in those mm -hmm. days, hardly, you know? Mm -hmm. And man, blew me right across the bathroom against the wall. And I says, I'm not going to say anything to anybody because I don't think I should have seen that. <laughs> and then, then when we got into New York to, to take the train up uh, to home, I had that, my hat, you know what sailor has, I had it on the back of my head. And the MPs were going to give me a, a captain's mask for having it on the back of my head. So when I got back to Panama, the captain laughed and he says, where did you think you were in Panama? <laughs> he laughed and he, he wrote it right off. <laughs> so when did you, uh, when were you discharged? Uh, when was I discharged? Let's see. Well, it was in November of uh, 47, I think. I, it could be, in my dates might be, I'll be right, but uh, see, my dad died and then I, offered to go another six months, so I went back to Panama after my dad died and completed that tour term, but I think I got out in November of, I think it was no November of uh, 47, I think. Let's see, I was 44, yeah, I think that's when it was. Okay. Were you uh, in Panama then for the surrender of Japan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, was there a celebration or? Well, I was aboard this YNG-9. Uh -huh. and. You could see, you know, it was a great place to be because on the ship you could see everything. And yeah, there was a lot of excitement and fireworks and everything. It was, it was a pretty exciting time. <laughs> Do you remember uh, hearing about the atomic bombs being dropped? <clears throat> you know, I certainly do because uh, one of our tr one of the things I was training for was uh, we we're going to gas the islands because they said, well, geez, you know, if we we'd lose a million men if we have to take island by island, and uh, that training was started and stopped, and the only reason it stopped was because the atomic bomb was coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what was your reaction to that? The atomic bomb? Yes. I was just, I'm delighted. I mean, you know, that well, was the enemy. I mean, there was yeah. no yeah. if, ands, or buts there. Now, now, what do you mean no you were areas. training to gas the islands? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that the, the Navy had started training servicemen, uh -huh. you know, <clears throat> to, to in, uh, not to invade the islands, but to, to gas them, and if you be, if they're using gas, you better learn how to get around it. Uh -huh. okay. Do you remember uh, hearing about the death of President Roosevelt? It's not a it's not something that just sticks yeah, in my yeah, mind in yeah, a date or anything. Yeah. Um, after you uh, got out of service, did yeah. you make use of the GI Bill at all? Oh, big time. <laughs> I instead of taking a remember the 5220 club. Okay, did you use that? No, I didn't use no, it. Never used I it. went to work for uh, 
how much was it, 60 cents an hour or something like that at the uh, Daystrom Furniture Factory. And I worked my way up. I was a night uh, sh shipping clerk for in this. And then uh, that, fall, that fall, I went to uh, Bryant Stratton Business School in Buffalo, majoring in sales and advertising. Uh -huh. And then uh, following that, I started as a freshman at Syracuse. <coughs> and uh, then I, I was there three years. I was working in the university infirmary from 11 at night to 7 in the morning, six days a week. I got mono the second year. Yeah. <laughs> and I kept getting farther ahead behind. So I went to Dean and I said, Dean, it, it just looks like I'm getting too far behind. I said, I think I'm going to drop out. He said, John? He said, my family went from riches to rags. We owned the ferry boat in, in San Francisco Bay. And of course, when the bridge went in, our first boat business went, to, and he said I had to drop out of high school twice. So uh -huh. I said I really wouldn't worry about it. And I won a GI scholarship, and yet I could still go to, I went uh, back out, and I went to Bowling Green State University in Ohio, majored in sales and advertising, majored in uh, journalism out there. Uh -huh. And then I was on the General Motors Parade of Progress show touring the country as a lecturer. That was a very interesting time in my life. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations at all? I joined the American Legion back then, but then I kind of, you know, you, you fade out of it a little uh -huh. bit. But now I'm a member of the VFW and American Legion. Uh -huh. Are you active as a member? Or? Yeah, I'm very active. Okay. Yep. Did you Especially uh, ever, VFW. ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Uh, you know, I didn't. Uh -huh. With a small boat like that, I yeah. couldn't even remember who was on it, yeah. to be honest with you. Uh -huh. And and then uh, when you're on the on the shore like that, and of course I wasn't on the LST long enough to make any kind of friendship. So well, interesting one thing though, when I was in the hospital overseas, uh, I was 21 days getting penicillin every three hours. That's three uh, to close this hole in my leg. And the guy next to bed to me was a guy by the name of Vince Pisano. And Vince. When I got to Syracuse, he was the editor of the Daily to Orange. Huh. So I went to work for him as a reporter on the sports page. Well, when we got out and I worked with the Highway Users Federation, I ran into Vince in Rochester. He was working for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. <clears throat> Speed up some time, he was the first editor of USA Today. Oh, really? Huh. And, and so I got to talk to him. And the next thing, you know, you look at the uh, masthead, and he wasn't on it anymore. I was like, geez, I wonder what happened. And I saw him a little later. He became president of USA International. And uh, so then I did, we did get back together, and uh, he was sort of the publisher of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, mm -hmm. and is retired now. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do you think that, uh, how do you think that your time in the service, did it affect or change your life in any way? You know, I, I don't think it did because I was a very happy person all my life. I had a wonderful mother and father. I didn't have any, you know, the problems that people talk about. And uh, if anything, I probably didn't get pushed enough because, you know, I, it, I've just had a great life. Uh -huh. okay. okay, well, thank you very much thank for you. your interview. <laughs>